Bruh, yeah, I have to. It's so, really? Oh yeah. Like if I don't if I, Oh yeah. Like if I don't wear a bonnet, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Enchanté. <laughs> oui, oui. <laughs> Looks like you're about to go plant, go paint in uh, en plein air out there, <laughs> painting a mural next to the street, <laughs> sipping on a little Chardonnay. Because the other day I was thinking, I was like, on the speaking stuff, I wanna, I wanna wear like ridiculous outfits, mm -hmm. but kind of subtle. So like, like wear a suit that's just like really big. Yep. <laughs> you know, have a tail that like un like it's released over time, or like come out with like bunny ears or something. But like nothing like too grand or anything, but just something that people are kind of like, is he? Is that? You know? <laughs> just fuck with him. But be completely like have a suit that's like ten sizes too big and just be. You know, it's like I'm a child in my dad's outfit. <laughs> oh my god, that's great! I love that. I love that. I I had this. I don't know. It's it wasn't related to speaking, but we were talking about this idea of like, you know, BRT being a a place where people come and and rest and like detach and disconnect and have the opportunity to. Should we record? Should it's we recording. Start? It's recording. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just randomly pressed the button and just like, we'll see what comes out of this. And here we are. Um, but yeah, just like this, this idea of BRT being a place of rest. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about like some of the synergy around that, the nap ministries and just the ethos and how it's, how it's relevant and related to what we're, we're creating. Um, and I was like, what if we just had some fly ass bathrobes? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it just and and not not in a like you know oh they're clearly wearing pajamas but like no those are some dope like comfortable ass looking robe situation that i kind of want to like that sounds fun that looks really yeah. comfortable right wait a minute wait a minute you know like the woo the woo has you know like the little little logo with the you know the w and looks like very kung fu-esque right mm-hmm and it's like the BRT is just like a blanket, you know, and like a robe or some kind of house slippers. Yeah. And with, a, with a bonnet on it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, but that is, I like that makes sense, bro, because for some reason, I don't know why, the last couple of weeks, I've just been seeing black women everywhere out in the streets with their bonnets on, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, where was I? Maryland, Chicago, DC. And I was like, and now like you pop on the camera with your bonnet on, and I'm like, what is going on with these bonnets? Mm -hmm. So the bonnets have been have been speaking to me recently. The bonnets, bro. Grab your BRT bonnet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got swag, BRT bonnet swag. Yesterday, one of the ladies, she didn't have a bonnet, but she's like, "We gonna be laying down?" I was like, "Yeah." She was like, "Okay." So she she like take too long to get this here. <laughs> like, hey, that's real though. That's real. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah." Like, okay, one sec. <laughs> get you a hair tie. Get you a BRT bonnet. <laughs> brt blanket because you know them, them temperatures be changing in your breath work practice yeah a little brt we ain't doing yoga mats we do we doing we doing um little little uh you know how when you go camping they got those little inflatable yeah you know mattresses so you're nice and comfortable when you're laying down we're not doing yoga mats we're doing those little brt inflatable beds <laughs> That's how we start every breathwork practice. We got to get them lungs ready. We blow up our little BRT <laughs> air air mattress, tiny little thin air mattresses. They're lung powered, lung powered. That way you're nice and comfy when you're doing your breathwork practice. We got your little BRT slippers, you know, take off them street shoes, get nice and comfy now. 
And if you want to be barefoot, that's cool. But when you get up and you start walking around this house, you better have some slippers on. I don't want them stanky little toes on my rug. <laughs> <laughs> don't be bringing that funk on my rug. I work hard to keep my house clean. <laughs> I like, I like that. Slippers, bonnet, air mattress, and blanket. <laughs> mm-hmm. The essentials, the coziness, the cozy essentials. Your neck pillow. Mm. I like mm-hmm. flowers. Mm-hmm. The Bring cozy, yeah, the cozy essentials. I dig that. Coming to a retail store near you. <laughs> <laughs> online online e-commerce store near you fill up your carts y'all <laughs> i'm on one today y'all. this is <laughs> i'm telling you bro it's a different energy i'm just like i was in the middle of a, of a conversation with one of my one of my co-workers and they're on my team and you know just random random thing i threw on their calendar it was just like hey Let's just check in end of week. I know it's been a tough week. A few things happen. And it was supposed to be like a 30 minute conversation. It turned into like 90 minutes. But like about half of that was me just going, going in on a bunch of different random shit that wasn't, it was not work related, but just like the energy. Salud. The energy was kind of like, yeah, it's just like the integration of all the selves, which we've talked about, right? This is a conversation you and I have been having for a long time. And like one of the things that I struggled with when I spent a lot of time like creating a brand, like a like a, a personal brand online was just feeling this two dimensionality of it all. And like, yeah, I'm a really nice fucking person. I'm aware of that. I have a lot of kindness. I'm very patient. But like, I'm also a little crazy. And like, I got a lot of expressiveness and I was feeling this like sense of being, you know, siloed small. Right. But I'm in this, I'm in this conversation. This is work related, right? Like this is nine to five corporate life, work related sales, high, high performing sales conversation. And I'm bringing in, you know, Rihanna songs and Beyonce songs and you won't make my song. No, you won't make my song. No, you won't make my song. You won't make my song. I'm telling everybody. Just like literally piping this person up, but like in the most ridiculous, non ordinary way of what you would expect. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's, 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 that's me. Mm. Mm. Like I'm the dude that will show up in the, in the boardroom. And be able to like have a conversation with the executive team and I'll hold my own and have what they call the executive presence, right? And in the next, you know, breath, I'll recite, you know, Tupac lyrics to you. And it's just something that I, I'm I'm appreciating about myself, but it took me a long time to really appreciate because at some point in my life I thought that I had to be like I had to fit into a box of some kind in order to be accepted. And actually, candidly, it started when I went to USC. Like it went from like, you know, I came from the Bay, middle of the hyphy movement, wearing, you know, white tees and Air Forces and, you know, this facing at the dance in the dance floor, throwing up gang signs and doing rack just doing ratchet shit. (laughs) Just doing ratchet shit. And going stupid dumb stupid dumb, you know hyphy in the on the on the on the shore bus like just like that was my thing i was in i was in the midst of that and it felt like home to me because it was it was just unapologetically expressive like that's what i love about the bay i love the bay for so many reasons but like one major reason is the expressiveness of of the Bay Area and the willingness to create shit that don't even make sense, bro. Like it's just, it's amazing. It is amazing. Like I have friends that would just create their entire, they had like a vocabulary. They had a whole vocabulary that they created for themselves. Like my boy AJ, he went by uh maniac. He 
instead of being like, yo, ketchup, nigga, he'd be like, yo, smash tomatoes. And I'm like, smash tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> like what he's like yeah catch up nigga i'm like oh my god like and t- you know i'm 16 15 16 years old like you know this is before the internet was a thing that you can like go to like what's another creative way that you could say catch up right like smash tomatoes nigga. i'm like okay all right I, like that's creative right that's creative anyways i'm going on a tangent here but my point is no, that no, it's, it's, keep going I, i'm enjoying this yeah my, my point is that i remember getting to sc right tall t I didn't wear tall tees. I wore, I wore white tees. I had like Foot Locker 5 for 25. That was my shit. You know, and I had the Air Forces that I had to like try to walk all weird. So I didn't crease them because I couldn't afford to buy another pair. But, you know, those, them, them was my Air Forces. I was really proud of them. I had my little sidekick, you know, little, <laughs> I had a little, you know, second gen sidekick, my little AIM. I was tweeting on my little hoes. It wasn't tweets back then. It was AIM conversations. But, you know, I was just, I was just, you know. <laughs> I was coming, coming from a particular place and I had, I had found, I had found home, right? I found home in that particular place. And, um, and then I came to SC and I remember being like, oh, wow, this is a different world. Mm. Like, this is a very different world. Culture shock. Talk about culture shock. But it was like a, oh, I don't know how to behave in this world. (laughs) (laughs) Like for real, <laughs> I remember sitting in my first my first writing class freshman year, and uh, yeah, Shiku, I won't say her whole name, but Shiku, I love I love Shiku so much. I remember listening to her speak for the first time, and I was like, I didn't understand about seventy five percent of what she said. I need to get a dictionary. I need to do something about my vocabulary because I don't understand what these people are saying. And she was so eloquent, so articulate, just compelling in what she had to say. And this is, you know, we're 17, 18 years old. She's coming into coming into college. And this is a, a writing class was, that was connected to Robin D.G. Kelly's um, American Studies class. Uh, for folks who don't know, Robin D.G. Kelly is an incredible historian who is um, who has documented a variety of different you know, civil rights movements or movements just in general in, in, in this country and is a phenomenal voice for understanding the history of of, of black culture in this country. And um, and so like I'm sitting in this class with Robin DG Kelly and I'm listening to him speak. I'm like, I don't understand most of what he's saying. Like I don't I literally don't know. And then I go to my writing class, which is connected to this this history class. And I'm listening to my 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 peers speak, and I'm like, I literally do not know what they're saying. I'm like, I can't. I don't even like. I want to participate. Help me, God, please. So I literally bought a dictionary and I started reading the dictionary, like freshman year. So that was like my first like, okay, I need to like make some changes in myself to be able to feel like I can fit in and participate. I think that was the thing was needing to feel like I could participate. And then it was like, oh yeah, I also probably should like not wear clothes that are too baggy. And, you know, maybe I'll, you know, be a little bit more thoughtful about my expressiveness. But it was an interesting, like, coming, like, almost collapsing of self into what needed to be in order for me to be able to function in this world, this new world I stepped into. So that that journey into, like, all right, let me figure out how to navigate this. It took a lot of effort and a lot of, like, remembering not even remembering honestly it was it was more like deciphering and attempting to identify how to how to sound how to speak mm. how to look mm. how to behave mm. the code switching was necessary in this moment for me at least i felt in order to actually survive and to thrive mm. in this in this environment but then like I think the antithesis of that or what happened to me in that process was that that code switching led to the death of, you know, an identity or who I understood myself to be. And like we practice resurrection and we talk about that. It's important for that to happen, right? The death of self and the, the opportunity for the birth of another self. But I'm also beginning to appreciate and this is where I'm tying it all into what, you know, you and I talked about briefly yesterday. Um. What do we ever talk about briefly? <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Fair. I've been speaking like, you know, this is like nine minute monologue here. Yeah. You're right. And then you're about to hop in. It's about to be another nine minutes. And like, <laughs> 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 no brevity here. 
Uh, the idea of like being willing to integrate all the different selves, it took a lot of like recognition and appreciation. And this is something that I heard from my, my therapist actually not too long ago, maybe a couple weeks ago, where she's like, no matter what happens in your life, you think that like the past is the past. You think that it's dead. You think it's gone. But like the truth is, it's never actually gone. You're always still carrying that part of you with you, whether it's joyful, whether it's traumatic or anything in between. And, you know, this idea of like dying to self, like fuck your story, which is the conversation we were having briefly yesterday. And it was only brief because we were doing it via text message. Um, but like also we hear your story, right? Like your story is relevant and it's valid. And the only way to be able to hold on to that paradox is, be, is to integrate. It's to say like all of this is fucking true. And none of it is true. <laughs> and that is where I'm finding myself navigating toward, right? And I've had to go through this journey. I mean, we graduated almost five, almost 11 years ago from SC. Yeah. Actually, at 11 years ago, like as of two weeks ago. Yeah. just a little continuation sidebar here it was 11 years ago that i was arrested after talking about the over policing in the the la area by dps at that time we little you know go back to episode one if you want to listen to a little nugget about that and how i was invited to come in and speak about it then i got my ass arrested i don't know if i shared about the arrested part no 11 years ago cinco de mayo got arrested um by the police officers around usc after spending an entire year writing a thesis about over policing in communities of color around sc but we'll get we'll, we'll talk about that another time side note sidebar um Manifestation. <laughs> yes, sir. Literally. I put way too much energy into that. <laughs> it's like welcoming it in. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I need some, I need some uh what do they call that? Um, I need some ethnographic research. Mm -hmm. I need a first person experience to, to be able to speak to this more candidly, more more intelligently. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up with this. The <laughs> process of discovering myself right oh yeah that version of the person that i've been like putting into the world feels two-dimensional the box that i've put myself in in an effort to, to to navigate this life and to succeed was a wonderful box that got me relatively far in life from a you know purely traditional versions or our de or de definitions of success now I'm done with the fucking box and I'm done with pretending like the other versions of myself don't exist. All of them des desire to be expressed and deserve to be heard and seen. And so your boy's going to show up to a motherfucking podcast recording with his bonnet on because it's six o'clock in the morning and I'm not going to pretend like I don't wear a bonnet at this time of the day because I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> every, every damn day i even almost kept my little sleep mask on it's right here i'm not even gonna lie bro like it was like on my head like this as i was like setting up I'm like maybe i'll just leave that on because like this is literally what i look like on the reg on the <laughs> regular every morning auntie <laughs> <laughs> Auntie. Auntie. Hey, Auntie. <laughs> oh my God. That's so funny. <laughs> the bonnet. The bonnet with the, the eye mask. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, there's no reason to, to continue playing uh small or one dimensional or like in one lane or anything like that and i think you know i realized that i have multiple well one i realized i had multiple sides of me two years ago when i learned a bit more about my astrology and i learned about like the gemini aspect mm. and and i was like oh okay and even my mom was like that makes sense mm. um, just talking about like different 
like very quick shifts in personality and um, like expressiveness, like being expressive and then withdrawn, withdrawn and then expressive. Yes and then no, left and then right. Um, so had some judgment around that. But then last year when I was um, in Kauai, I, uh, I took the time to actually name all those different parts of me um, because I feel like, you know, the zodiac signs help just give a little tether and like a little like foundation. Um, but each sign has a duality. Um, mm-hmm. Each sign has two sides. And Gemini, by definition, is the twin that has two sides. And so, you know, just using that logic, I was like, okay, there's probably six different parts of me mm-hmm. that I was able to identify and label <clears throat> from when I was a kid until now. And all these different versions of myself, you know, they're constantly in communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're in continuous, uh, nonstop dialogue. Um, but I think what's what's helped me like acknowledge and hear them and hold space for them while also not really letting them as much as I can inform my present moment experience mm-hmm. is um well one it, it's the name Ruah and like you know just how that came about and what it means in certain languages, you know, like the association of it with breath and holy wind and spirit. Um, in Hebrew, and how um, that isn't something that is like fixed, you know, like you can't contain air, you can't contain breath. Mm. But then I started doing this exercise a few weeks ago called the, uh, oh God, it was this dude, Douglas J. Harding, who um, had this out of body experience one time when he was hiking. And, um, he said when he came back into his body, what the main takeaway was that when he was in this altered state, he realized he has no head. Mm. And mm. it's really called like the headless exercise and experiment. And um, I've had a bunch of people do it now that I've worked with and some people just for fun where you, you, you basically, and this is like the most basic version of the exercise. He's got many, um, you, you point. So you make sure your your fingers in like your line of sight and you point to things outside of you and you just identify them, you just label them. So fridge, TV, plant, mirror, et cetera, et cetera. Then you slowly bring the finger down and you keep labeling what you see. And as you bring the finger up towards you, you're still labeling what you see. But when you get to you, sometimes people will say me, right? But the reality is it's like, well, what are you actually looking at? Mm-hmm. You're looking at it, your hand, your finger, you know, but you're pointing at you. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, where is you? Well, I'm pointing at me. Well, where is it? It's in my head. Is it? It's actually in your head? Can you show me? Can you tell mm-hmm. me? Um, and what you get as you continue asking those questions and peeling that layer, those layers back is like, no, it just feels like it's in my head, right? But the mm-hmm. reality is it's not. I'm aware, like even in this moment, I'm aware of my head. So how mm-hmm. is it in my head? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, because you can see out of two eyes. Okay, if I can see out of two eyes, then shouldn't there kind of be like a split in the middle? Mm-hmm. A window frame? Yeah, maybe, but no, it, it honestly just looks like a big screen. So for me, being aware of my little um, like cast of characters within and being aware of, of, of the present moment and being aware that they're always dancing, the way that I feel like I've been able to find that balance um, is by literally watching everything as if it's a movie, mm-hmm. like, like literally watching it so much so that I'm just like, I wonder what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. This is so fascinating. <laughs> um, and just like when you're watching a movie, you know, you know that you're watching a movie, right? And so you make it invested in the story they feel um, one way about this character, another way about a different character. But at the end of the day, it's a movie and those people can't actually do anything to you. That story mm-hmm. can make you feel a certain way, but like we, not that I'm aware of, we don't have the technology where they can just grab you and pull you into the screen, right? So you're literally the observer the whole time. And so when I think about it from that perspective, I'm like, man, I'm not even worried about the stuff outside of me. The stuff inside of me is a movie. Mm-hmm. Everything, it's like the movie, um, what was the movie, the Pixar movie with all the emotions and everything? Inside Out. 
inside out. It's like that. Mm -hmm. And just looking at it from that perspective internally as well as externally, it just allows like that whole dance to occur between all the different parts of me without me feeling, you know, like swayed in one direction or the next. Mm -hmm. um, really just able to be there and observe it and enjoy it and like catch myself when I'm getting too caught up thinking that I'm in the movie. Um, because the reality is, and we talked about this in episode one, you know, everyone's in their own movie. Mm -hmm. Everyone is literally in the, 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 the reality that their mind continually creates, right? So you have this agreed upon reality, right? Like right now it's a little weird because we're in two different places, like we're on the computer, but we can both probably agree that um, we're talking to each other through our devices. Mm -hmm. Right, you're in your office, I'm in another place, but like, this is what's happening. We have a three hour time difference with you being on the West Coast, me on the East Coast. You're wearing a bonnet, I'm wearing a red hat. We're doing episode two of Between Two Breaths, right? Mm -hmm. We can agree on that. But we are having completely different experiences of the entirely different experiences of this moment. Mm -hmm. Most subtle ways that ultimately shape and define our perception of this experience. You know, extreme versions are like, someone may be colorblind, someone may be seeing things, someone, they're just different visual things that may like literally reshape the landscape more internally. Someone may not feel comfortable in a space that's a little darker. Maybe the light is too bright for someone, you know, like who knows and how that's affecting them internally. But even still, like just those small little, differences that we possess that make us who we are like these are our ingredients that's what's determining how we experience this uh this moment and like it's it's all unique everyone it's snowflakes everyone is different and i think what what is becoming really cool is like and i think this is part of maturity i think this is part of doing the work um it's a part of just like who we are um as individuals but i think it's really fun to curiously explore how other people view their movie mm -hmm. instead of wanting them to be in mine or hoping they want me in theirs mm -hmm. because that's the thing like it gets kind of meta here as an actor that i've had to realize is that unless you're like one of the biggest actors in the world you know and there's like 10 of them maybe um the reality is that you're in someone else's story. You're a piece, you're a color in someone else's picture. You're a brush. Mm -hmm. And I began noticing like how that was affecting my life when, um, you know, you get an audition and then they send you the character breakdown. Mm -hmm. the character breakdown is what they have in mind for the character. And what they hope that you'll do is like find some, happy medium between what you bring and what they see and like hopefully it blows their mind and they want to give you lots of money because this project is going to be a big hit and they're all going to like, that's what that's the hope right mm -hmm. and um rarely is that the reality but what it made me realize one time I, I i did get an audition and i didn't get a character breakdown and i was about to ask my friend who sent me the audition where's the character breakdown and i said no mm -hmm. I'm just gonna feel into what this character is for me. Mm -hmm. And it was like a light bulb moment of like, oh yeah, how often have you tried to fit the character breakdown uh, for someone that you wanna date? Mm -hmm. um, for someone that you wanna be your best friend, for basically anyone that you wanna share time with for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. like, for this person, like a coach, you know, for sports, a director, for artists, you know, like a certain professor for the academics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do I need to be? Who do I need to become to fit in at USC? Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm tying that all together. I had mm -hmm. no idea how I would. I didn't even plan on it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was coming. It's coming. It is, it is. So when I got to USC. I... <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Not masterfully done. I gotta just I gotta acknowledge it. I had no idea it was coming. And then you said US was like this mother this mother wait a minute. Wait, I have no idea. I have no idea. 
Um, but that's that's a whole nother thing. It's like, I don't want to have an idea anymore mm -hmm. because I don't have any idea. But what I want to do is be able to trust the fact that I've done, one, I've done the work, mm -hmm. right? So I know the integrated selves are there, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, um, just being clueless and I'm not just being taken for a ride. It's like, I know who I am in this moment. So I'm mm -hmm. clear on that. And at the same time, I have no idea who I am to the next moment. I have no idea who I am to the next person. And so I want to continuously remain open to that because that's super interesting to me because I know myself. Mm -hmm. Before this, I wanted to know what people thought, same things, but I didn't know myself. So it was easier to get swayed this way and that way. And that's why when I got to USC, I think, you know, I didn't, USC was not my first choice. I didn't really know. I didn't really like it when I visited. Mm -hmm. It was super white. I had been at PWIs my whole life. And it wasn't like I was looking to go to an HBCU or anything, but I just, I wanted some more flavor. I wanted some more like juice. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, wanted to go to another PWI, um, University of Miami, but like Miami's Miami. So it's like, it's, it's more tropical. There's more of that flavor and it's, it's humid, trick daddy. Like, <laughs> it's just like, it's a whole thing down there, right? <laughs> it's a whole thing. And so that, that didn't happen. So I was at USC and I was resentful my first semester. Like I did not want to be there. Mm. Thinking about um, transferring back to Maryland, you know, the University of Maryland, just because mm. oh, what am I doing out here? And I was familiar with California, both Southern and Northern because my parents had, were from there. And so like, I didn't feel like a, a, a stranger in this land. But what I did immediately notice is how within the first I think three days I met Ray, who's now Knight. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, Apollo, who was an RA there, he had said, I told him about the, my desire to act and everything. And he was all, oh, you need to meet this guy, Ray, blah, blah, blah. I was like, cool. So Ray just happened to be on an elevator that mm -hmm. I was about to, it was in floor tower where uh, my dorm was. And he was on the elevator, the door opened. And I was like, I guess maybe. Apollo had pointed him out or like described him. And I was like, you, you're the guy, right? I was like, you're right, you're right. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, what's up, nigga? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, hey, chill, chill. You know. <laughs> That's pretty damn good. <laughs> we love you, right. night. <laughs> um, but I remember he had like a green polo, he had jeans. Um, I don't remember what shoes he had on. But what I do remember is he had these little, little dreads. They're little dreads. Mm -hmm. They're long dreads now. Mm -hmm. And for me, he reminded me of home. He reminded me of DC because in DC, dreads are a big thing. And I said, I said, you remind me of home. And he just happened to be that, you know, point of contact with the acting and this new world and my old world. But, um, you know, I was also out there with Kristen. Kristen came from DC, um, Kristen Turner. And um, I felt like maybe I had a little more of a, like a, a home bubble with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And I held on to that. You know, I was wearing Nike boots in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> like, I had my fucking North Face fleece. Like, <laughs> you, don't, you, know, you don't need this stuff, bro. And, and, like, I remember, like, getting into little, you know, not serious, but little arguments with, with people, you know, about the East Coast and, and the West Coast and Nike boots and, like, whatever, whatever. <laughs> Just, like, stupid stuff. But I, I, I maintained that DC persona because, like, that felt safe to me. And then, like, as I got into the school, I kind of opened up more and, like, got a bit more um, enmeshed in, in the USC culture. Um, but I definitely held on to that, um, because I felt like it was kind of, uh, that was my lifeline. Mm -hmm. So it was like, where it feels like for you, you were shifting a bit to like fit in that being your lifeline. Like for me, home was my lifeline and, and holding on to that. And like this funny shit that was happening, 
me and like, you know, people slacklining and playing Frisbee and, <laughs> you know, it's like wearing rainbows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was like a whole, it was like the movies mm -hmm. and like, I was no stranger to privilege or like intellect intellectuals, but like the privilege was like pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. um, the people were very smart and, um, I think like if anything, man, like I kind of just chilled. Mm -hmm. you know, I think I just kind of pulled back um, from being that expressive. But I think it's also because my friend Ray, or Knight now, he played that role. Mm -hmm. And I think I've allowed the friends that I've had to play that role. Mm -hmm. to be expressive one to be the one that kind of disturbed the air because they have and i think now i guess because i do feel so you know well integrated and balanced it's like that's now what i desire but not for any other reason just then to spark curiosity in someone else about my movie mm. what i'm experiencing my movie mm -hmm. um, not trying to get anything or like extract, but just like engage at a level that's just a little different and that it, it wakes people up, but it doesn't, it's not a punch in the face. It's not, um, it's not jarring. Um, it's not antagonizing. It's just like someone walks into a space. Who's that? Mm -hmm. you know, they're a little different. Mm -hmm. what are they about? Even if I don't say anything to them, like their energy makes me feel a certain way. And if like that, if that's all that I can accomplish, that's great because then your perspective shifts a little bit. And like, maybe you can begin to start integrating all the different parts of yourselves and, you know, like living this more authentic life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that's the, we've talked about this from day zero but I think just as examples, like two men of color who are expressive in all these ways, who are also deeply compassionate, who also practice breath work and mindfulness and talk about spirituality and have a deep love for each other and actually are willing to navigate these emotional waters together just by representation. It's a, pers it's a perspective shift. And I think it's taken you know, 30 some odd years for me to appreciate that's the role that I tend to play. And even there are still times, you know, I'm, I'm a work in progress forever and I'm appreciating that I will always have my edge. I'm always going to be pushing, navigating an edge. And there were moments when I pushed that away and I'm like, I don't want to be that person for you, the person that helps shift your perspective, right? I don't want to be that person for you that you look to and say like, well, how are you doing it? Like you're doing, you're a sales manager and you're a husband and a father and a business owner. And like the things you talk about every day about breath work and spirituality and mindfulness and peak performance, like how do you make all those things integrate into yourself? And it's like, well, I'm the intersection. That's how it works. <laughs> it works because I'm the person doing it. That's the way that it all integrates. But like sometimes I find myself pushing, right? I'm like, ah, that's, I don't want to be that person for you, right? That responsibility that comes from that, the way that I kind of interpret it is almost as if somebody's looking for, you know, looking to hook in. They want to hook into me, into mm -hmm. my life force, my life, my life source in some kind of way. And candidly, they want to, they want to, what they see in me is actually something that exists in them. They just have a hard time seeing it for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so my question for you is I listen to you share and you spend a lot of time navigating the physical world. I spent a lot of time navigating the digital world as a result of our life, you know, life circumstances and what's available to us. So my, I have a little bit more of a barrier that exists where I can just like cut people off or shut it down or just like, all right, well, I'm not interested in engaging in that digital sphere now. I'll just like close it off for a little while. How do you navigate that? Those moments where people might see you and like, wow, Rua, you got this like thing that I want. I want to know more. I want to be more. I want to see more. Like, how do you do it? And they hook into you. How do you navigate 
protecting your energy and, 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 and establishing those boundaries, whether they be physical, whether they be per, uh, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, what does that look like for you? Um, I mean, it literally is the Gretchen Wieners. Like, you can't sit with us. <laughs> yeah. You can't sit here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for me, I don't say that. It's it's more, I've intentionally, my spirit team does that for me. Mm. You know, so like my intention and therefore my like created reality and experience is that I want my spiritual team, my guides, my angels, my ancestors, my, my totem, my spirit animal, whatever it may be, higher self. I want my relationship with them to be so strong that I don't need to say anything um, to make sure someone doesn't hook onto me because they're making sure that happens. Mm. And I think um, in years past, I think, you know, we all have this. It's this invisible group and they're always protecting us. It's just us making, it's using our free will to decide, do we want to listen? Do we not? Do we want to follow our desires? Do we want to keep going along this wheel of karma? And I think, you know, the most prevalent example of like your spirit team trying to keep you on the right track and, and you feeling like, oh, man, you know, it's the wrong track is when you get rejected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Specifically from something you really want, you know, whether it's a relationship or a job. Um, and I just, I was reading somewhere recently, it was talking about, you know, like maybe rejection is just redirection. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And like, I, again, it's just a simple perspective shift that can save me so much time, could have saved me like years of heartbreak and agony and, uh, you know, wishful thinking and resentment, all these things. Like if I was just able to operate with that frame of mind of like, okay, not this, not them. Cool. Let's keep going. Mm -hmm. um, instead of being like, it has to be, you know, why is it not, you know, like, why don't they love me? All that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And um, so that's, that's really, that's, that's really the answer. And like, I want to get to a place where I have no, unless I absolutely have to, I have no um, conflict in my life mm. externally in the sense of like i am not feeling as if i'm fighting battles in my life mm -hmm. because i know the battles are in here mm -hmm. and i know this is where the whole drama unfolds and the bloodshed occurs and i feel like if that is given enough energy and and um time to play out when I move through the world, it is literally just like watching a movie of something else that's happening to me, around me, with me, through me, but it's not bringing me into the fight, you know, because mm -hmm. the fight's already over, you know, and, and, and I would ultimately want that to extend to like difficult conversations that could feel combative or like conflicting by nature, where it's like the internal work has been done to such an extent so that I just show up. I'm calm, I'm ready, I'm relaxed, um, I'm present, I'm engaged, but it's not, it's not a battle, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a fight because that, that has already occurred. And like, unless it's an absolute last resort, um, because I, you know, I think also that one thing I've always had an interesting, like, I guess, relationship with is figuring out how I relate to violence. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because I think like, like we've come from two different experiences growing up when it comes to violence and experiencing it close firsthand. And we also live in a society that, you know, outside of the people that like have no choice because they're the kind of the butt of the joke of this society, uh, we're kind of protected mm -hmm. from day to day violence even things as simple as like killing to eat, mm -hmm. even just like picking flowers or plants to eat. You know, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily a violent act, but you are taking something. We don't even have to do that, right? So it just makes me like think sometimes about how, again, like I was saying, the, the, the battle is internal, right? Mm -hmm. And 
times where that battle has been very violent internally, very brutal. And those are those times. But these times <clears throat> moving forward internally and externally, there is like, there's just something that's been like, like playing like on a loop in my mind about like how sometimes violence is necessary mm -hmm. and violence isn't inherently bad. Right. It's like when you distance yourself from violence, when it becomes extreme, when it becomes oppressive, when like you're doing it literally to harm someone or something, that is bad. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. But violence in itself, I saw this beautiful um, ballet performance in Mexico City, Ballet Folklorica, just last week with my mom. It was so beautiful. And one of our favorite pieces, two of them actually, had to do with violence. Mm -hmm. The first one was these women from the countryside. Um, so the ballet folklorica is like all these different, this myriad of cultural um, examples of expression and dance and uh, performance from all over um, the different Mexican states. So you had the mariachis, you had these guys like going at it on the harps, you had the yeah. dancing, you had the lasso guy, you know, it was like, it was amazing, amazing. <laughs> um, and so in one of the performances, there were these women that were doing um, like, um, they were demonstrating, you know, how the women had to take up arms, you know, mm. at different points during, um, of conflict in the history. And it was so powerful watching these women, like with their guns, doing the choreography. And like, normally it's the guys, but like watching them be soldiers and they had the drum, boom, boom, mm. God, banging these war drums. And it was like, it was like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, like, go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, the one that was super violent was this dude who was embodying a deer. Mm. He was running around and it's like it's animal work. He was running around, he was jumping, he was prancing, he was moving his head, he was drinking the water. It was beautiful. And then these two other guys come out and they're the hunters. Mm. The bow and arrow. And you see the dance that is the standoff between the hunter and the prey. And they, they ultimately shoot the deer, they shoot him twice and they, they kill him. And it was just like so arresting because it was like, yeah, that's sometimes needed. Um, and you can't ignore that. Mm -hmm. you know? Ignore the beauty of the tragedy of this majestic creature dying, right? To feed these people and their, their community. Um, and and that's always something, you know, like ever since, I guess, I don't know, maybe in my 20s, I, I just started thinking about that because I, I think when you're removed from it, um, <clears throat> and then I, I think about, you know, like just the United States being the biggest bully on the block. Mm -hmm. now, like the American way comes from massive violence. Mm -hmm oppression and brutality and like the most extreme, heinous, horrible ways. But that allows us to go to Krispy Kreme drive through and, you know, get fucking a dozen donuts and coffee with cream and sugar without having to think about where it came from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's so, it's, so it's like, it's, it's inextricably linked. And I guess, I guess I'm trying to figure out, you know, my relationship to it, uh, because I do want to integrate it into mm -hmm. myself in a healthy way. And I don't feel like it, it comes in the form of doing a martial art the way I did a few years ago, not necessarily, but I think it's energy. Mm -hmm. Like there is a, a severity that comes with violence that I think can take shape energetically that at least where I'm at right now mentally, I think would be like very potent mm -hmm. for making sure no one gets their hooks in and like keeping negative energies at bay or like really fighting energies that want to, that want to do harm and want to mm -hmm. use violence for bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe that's naive and, and wishful thinking, but I don't, I think, I think there's something to it. <clears throat> I would agree. So there's, um, the creation of the universe was a violent act and everything that exists in our universe is violent. Like we think that, you know, we live on a, you know, if we, if we look at it from a macro perspective, right. And we take into consideration the formation of the earth as an example, like this earth was a fucking giant ball of molten rock and like fire and brimstone was hailing down constantly. And 
it was not a hospitable place by any stretch of the imagination. And that's how the majority of our universe is today. And this like creation of our moon was a was born from a from a violent collision, a massive meteor crashing into actually it was a twin, a twin planet that was that crashed into the earth and gouged out a part of our earth and yeah. exploded the other twin planet that effectively turned into our moon today. And so our moon is a combination of Earth and this twin planet that was very similar to in size to Earth and that used to orbit, you know, near each other. And our universe is a violent place. Everything about it is violent. It's destructive. It is unapologetically and not in a like harm, like wanting to do harm way, but just in the sense that like life and creation is a process of destruction. And I remember when I was in, when I was doing my yoga teacher training in Florida, we would have a pose where it was near the end, almost right before we got to Shavasana. But there was a reason why I was at the end right before Shavasana, because Shavasana is the corpse pose, right? You're dead at that point. There was this kind of dance where we'd be closed up and, you know, uh, as if we are the moment before the big bang. Mm. And that moment before is peaceful. It's finite, right? And it's just like this infinitesimally tiny dot moment where you're kind of bunched up and then you kind of flail open. And this flailing open is this, I want to say it was blanking on the name of it. I think it was like a sh sh some reference to Shiva. You're like flailing open and laying on your side. And this is like the, the chaos that is born from that moment of creation. And so violence is born. It's literally the birth of our existence was a violent act and everything about it is violence in, nat in nature. And in order for us to create anything, there has to be a destruction of something else. That's always the case. The transference of energy must take place by destroying the thing to create something else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the, that's the, the law of thermodynamics, right? Like energy is not created it is just simply transformed. It's transferred over. And so when we think about even just birth, birth is a violent act. It's painful. It's bloody. It's messy. There's a lot of yelling and screaming and crying. And there's just like literal, you know, human body parts and fluids everywhere in that process. It's a violent act. Mm. But from that violence comes the beauty of a baby, right? The paradox it's just themed it's the theme of today mm -hmm. and so i agree with you 1000 percent that violence is a necessary part of life and in fact this is part of what my journey was and it's tying in perfectly of course to what we talked about today is like i was a violent motherfucker for most of my life mm -hmm. and i got to usc and i was like i gotta kind of silence that nigga like he's gonna get me in trouble right and in that process of attempting to silence that version of myself, I killed that part of myself, which is not a healthy way to live either. Yeah. And that effectively um, neutering myself led to a whole host of challenges emotionally, mentally, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. All of that was born from me cutting out that violent part of me. In well, my, you, you cut it out, but it was just inverted. It, it was, was inverted. Like expressing it, so it got inverted. And so, yeah, all those suicidal thoughts and like all that negativity was just brewing inside because it was a war going on that at one point you had been able to release externally. Mm -hmm. One thousand percent. That's a great way to, to to put it because it doesn't go anywhere again, right? The energy doesn't. It can't be killed off. The energy is not destroyed. It can only be transferred, and so instead of expressing it outwardly, which was for me, it was through physical violence and up to a point where I, and then I realized I, I can be as destructive as I want to be on a football field and hurt people and be and get away with it. I loved that. I fucking <laughs> loved it. I was a fucking gladiator, right? And it was just one of those things where I walk on the field, like, who am I going to take out today? Like, who going who gonna to get it today? I can't wait. <laughs> You know, it's like, who going to get these hands? Who going to catch these hands today, right? And that that energy 
like you said, because I realized that in order for me to fit into the box that I thought was necessary for me to succeed in this new world, I had to take part of that self and, and redirect it in a way. And the complexity of all of this, and again, the paradox here is like, I've always been a kind person too. There's been kindness in my heart for my entire life, but there's there's the destruction that's necessary and it's a part of every one of us. And I think that's the point that you're getting to here, which is that every single one of us has the capacity for destruction and and to and to be a deliverer of violence whether it's in the form of death whether it's in the form of you know heinous acts whether it's in the form of picking a plant killing an animal harming another person we love dearly whatever it is we all have the capacity for it and when i figured out that that was part of what needed to be expressed i didn't discover it until i got to a breathwork class and and we've talked about this in in this treatment center um in Florida, you know, laying in a bank vault with a bunch of men, I've discovered this fucking rage that I was carrying still. And I was like, oh, that's right. I remember this and this feels good and it feels powerful and it feels strong and it feels like I can protect myself with this because it protected me for a long time. And it was in that place of discovering that rage and giving it the freedom to be expressed that I realized that there's nothing wrong with it. It just has to be constructively directed mm -hmm. and i'm not a hunter if i were to eat meat again it would be only by my own hands i would i would have to be the one that hunts the animal and cleans the animal and cooks the animal it'd have to be fully my process because to your point if i'm going to participate in the violent act of a destruction to consume something i have to be the one to do it because for me it feels like that's the only way to authentically align with what's really at play here which is the natural forces going back to the creation of the universe right death has been a necessity for life for as long as life has been present we have had to consume other beings in order for life to persist and now we can i'm you know vegan here i consume our our, our distant relatives by the by by means of plants but we're all fucking related Yes, you are related to your tree. In fact, like 50% of your DNA is the same as a tree in your backyard. It's kind of crazy, but like, it's true. We're all coming from the same thing. And so, you know, if I'm going to do it, if I'm going to eat my auntie by way of the deer, you know, I'm going to have to be the one that puts her down. I'm going to be like, auntie, I love you. I'm sorry, but I got to feed my family, boo. You know, that this is true. And you would do the same thing if you, if, if, if the roles were reversed, right? So anyways, like the, the process of getting to that place where, integrating the violence and and using it energetically the first thing i think is giving the violence a space to be expressed like permission for that to be expressed and you said like martial arts was an interesting thing that you got to explore in your life at some point um and it may not necessarily be that but i know for me what i need is a space where it's contained and intentional for me to, to develop a relationship with it. <clears throat> so I do a lot of yelling into pillows. I do a lot of breaking of boxes. I beat up Bob, which is my punching dummy. These are like intentional areas where I can practice my relationship with anger, with rage, with destruction. And then what it, that teaches me is that anger is a is necessary part of creating healthy boundaries, right? So to the point about being able to protect yourself from people who might be wanting to hook in, boundaries are born when I recognize that anger has told me I've been slighted in some way and a boundary has been crossed that I'm not happy about. And when I feel that anger, it tells me that I have an internal compass that shows me this is not okay with me. I want something different here. And that difference could be the way that I show up in the relationship or it could be an outward expression to this person or place or thing, whatever it is that may have infracted upon my boundary and the way of, hey, this is not okay with me. I have expectations. These are, these are what those expectations are. This is where the line is drawn. If you cross it again, there will be consequences. Yeah. And it, consequences could be you're going to catch these hands, nigga, or they could be just like, <laughs> <laughs> or I can be like, I got to you know make some changes here in this relationship. But I think that, especially as men, um, you know, in this world, uh, we are, we are told 
over and over again that violence is not okay, that anger is not okay. And we are shown that that's not okay, especially as men of men of color, like in this world over and over again. Because if you express anger as a man, as a man of color in this world, you may find yourself on the other end of a pistol held by a person that's supposed to be protecting and serving you, right? Or you might find yourself back to the story of me getting arrested. Right? You might find yourself in handcuffs and arrested several days before your, you know, your college graduation because you had you expressed anger because you were, felt like a boundary was crossed by by a police officer or someone in, in authority, right? So finding healthy ways to express it and and ways that it can be safe and contained, so that we can develop that relationship with our anger, so that we can learn how to express it in a way that is healthy and constructive is I think the path but candidly this is my my life's work is for sure figuring out how to integrate my healthy anger yeah I don't think you're alone on that um I mean I, I definitely also <clears throat> had an experience early on in USC with a bout of rage that um, scared me, scared my parents back on the East Coast, scared the friends that I was with, and scared the individual that it was it was you know directed at. Um, even like weeks later, and uh, I you know I, I kind of pulled back for you know fear of being arrested or you know whatever, and um, but that was always there, that was always dormant, and um, I think you know. I think the balancing act really starts with, you know, understanding that everything, you know, does possess a degree of violence and, mm -hmm. and there is, there is compassion in violence when it's coming from love. Mm -hmm. um, like in, 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 like as an example, just a mama, a mama wolf, mama bear, right? That for whatever reason, has always that's always talked to me louder than like papa bear or mm -hmm. like papa wolf there's something about mama wolf or mama bear energy or like big cat mama whatever just like mama animal energy that's not you know trying to eat her babies but protect them <laughs> that is so scary to mm -hmm. me it's it's such a formidable energy mama lion you know like it's you see these videos of these big masculine creatures really cowering sometimes um, from the the feminine, the female in the mm -hmm. herd or the tribe, the tribe. Um, and um, I don't, I never knew what it was, but I, I think now that we're having this conversation, I, I think what it is is it's just like that violence is like a protection of love. Mm -hmm. it's a protection of not necessarily like i'm going to protect my children from the cruelties of the world but it's it's a protection of like this is these beings right now this is love mm -hmm. right and the world is going to happen they're going to have their experiences um but nothing is going to infringe upon them as representatives of love mm -hmm. you know whatever, form they come out as human animal um whatever it may be <clears throat> and i think that's that's the thing that feels right to me it's like being a warrior for that mm -hmm. and um i think that you know goes to something that we've been aware of and tugging on the string of for the last few years but being earth warriors mm -hmm and understanding like you know the energy required and the tenacity needed and the ferocity and but also also the creativity and the flexibility and the malleability and the like swiftness of thought that i think is actually more in alignment with that warrior archetype now mm -hmm. um, than it was before right i think the patience the kindness i like I feel like you embody very much that energy with how you raise your children. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's like, no, the violence of the past, no. 
because they are love, mm -hmm. right? And it's so easy to just like bring that in to their experience and then the cycle continues. But you and your wife have made a firm decision like, hey, no, mm -hmm. right? It's parts of you, no, not here, not happening. Mm -hmm. Things are love. And I think if we're able <clears throat> to obviously start there with ourselves, with our dyad, with our, our families, uh, immediate, you know, small communal groups and circles, and maybe expanding out from there, like, but knowing that at the end of the day, we're all standing on Mama Earth. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are her thoughts. Um, <laughs> you know, like we're the movie that she's experiencing and it's been a hell of a one mm. that she's had to endure and that she's endured, you know? And, and, and I think like the, the least that we can do with our time as being a part of the mind of Mama Earth is to do the same shit that we've been doing with the work we've been doing. It's like, hey, let's get right. Let's get centered, let's get integrated, and let's get clear on how we can move forward with more love and compassion and kindness. Um, because she's been here the mm -hmm. whole time. Mama's been here. It's like treating your mom like shit your whole life. And then when she dies, oh, I love you so much, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. And then she's gone, mm -hmm. gone forever. <clears throat> it's the same thing, you know, like, the earth is is getting bombarded. It's getting beat up. And because so many of us, like because of culture or society or, you know, just like not even caring, um, don't really feel a connection. That's why I think it's so beautiful where you live and like you have that very clear symbiotic relationship to your environment. Um, so many of us don't have that connection. So we don't even feel it. There is no place. Mm -hmm. uh, we're more connected to our, our sneakers or, you know, like the clothing brand or like a bag that we want um, than what actually is like giving you the material for those sneakers mm. and that bag. And the reverence, just like any great warrior, any great fighter, you have to have reverence. Mm -hmm. You know, arrogant ones flame out. You have to have reverence, you have to have respect and you have to have discipline. And I think for me, what this conversation is helping me with is like understanding that that energy, although it's going to be used socially as well, you know, like in terms of I want to maintain a certain level of um, clarity and like, you know, like detachment and engagement, and all those things. Um, it really is about the earth. Mm -hmm. It's about the earth and finding more and more ways to engage with the earth that isn't just in service to the earth but it's 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 in celebration with mm -hmm. you know going kayaking you know going swimming um just taking a hike um listening to the birds you know and if you see some trash pick it up um speaking to the plants like i know you do and like i, I even do it um and just being being with nature um because nature is nature will, will teach us everything we need to know. Mm hmm. One hundred percent. I think you you identified a really important point of how to have constructive anger. It has to be intentional, and you have to stand for something. And then that anger is used to to, to protect the thing that you stand for, or to fight for the thing that you stand for, because like unbridled anger is destructive mm -hmm. unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. but intentional anger that is directed to protect and or fight for the thing that you stand for, that is a good fucking anger. Mm -hmm. Like that, that kind of violence is a beautiful, beautiful violence to be in, to be, to witness. And back to the story that you were sharing about the, the ballet in Mexico, you know, that violence of the, of the death of, of the deer was a necessity because the people who were hunting it were fighting for the survival or, or the nourishment of their families, of their village. Those women that were picking up weapons and arms to protect, they were standing for the protection of their families in the village. 
right? When this anger that is that is the, the mama bear that is raging out against anyone trying to get near her cubs, that's an anger that is standing for something, right? Like an earth warrior standing for the protection, preservation, conservation of the earth. That's a beautiful anger to, be, to bear witness to. That's the kind of anger that people celebrate, acknowledge, appreciate, and, and, and can accept as like, yeah, that makes fucking sense. I love that. That's powerful. And I couldn't agree with you more. Like you and I, you and I have been on the same page about this for a long time. And for me, it, it took me having kids to appreciate it. Mm. It took me having kids to recognize like, oh, that's right. The world that I am leaving for them mm. is a world that is wounded. Mm. What can I do to support mm. the, the earth, the, the mama earth, the world that I'm leaving for them so that it's not as wounded as it is today? Mm -hmm. mm. And that, that in itself is something to fight for. It, mm. And again, that's a selfish thing. And I think oftentimes we need that as human beings because we're inherently selfish fucking people. And that's okay. That's mm -hmm. okay. We beat ourselves up so much over that, but that's, it's okay. You know, but I think the 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 thing that has helped me with the selfishness is like, oh yeah, let me leave a world where my children feel like they are safe, they are cared for, they have all of the nutrients and sustenance and uh, a hospitable and you know environment for them to actually thrive in. That selfish thought brought me into considering how I can possibly be different and do different. And when I when I think about what is a selfish thought that could potentially inspire more people to take action, to be in celebration and service toward and for the earth, it's the breath. <clears throat> because the thing that we are 100% dependent on every single moment of every day is the breath. It's 20,000 a day. And every breath that we take is born from the earth. Yeah. The oxygen that fills our lungs is a byproduct of the plants around us. It's a byproduct of the oceans and all the plankton and all the coral that produce the O2 forest to breathe. It's a byproduct of the forest and the rainforest that literally produces 30% of the oxygen that we breathe every day. Like We would not have breath if this earth is not cared for. And if you need motivation enough, the thing that literally sustains you every moment of every day is at risk because of the harm that we've caused this earth and the lack of reverence for a mama earth. If that's not motivation enough, I don't know what is. That's a, that's a beautiful place to end. <laughs> place in that that's that that's that's our mission mm -hmm. you know we've been we've been finding our way to that mm -hmm. you know we've been finding our way we've been a little too selfless mm -hmm. but i think in the process it's good because it's allowed us to see where we can be selfish mm -hmm. where we can put up those boundaries because we didn't start <clears throat> with the blinders on you know we started very open you know and now the camera is getting a little more focused and we we've experienced like we know we've done this we've done that and now that works that doesn't work let's take what works and discard what doesn't and there's there's been that through line from the beginning of one the breath being you know the vital source the most essential aspect of life um to you know the self and situational awareness and how you engage with that breath and then three the place where you're engaging mm -hmm. no matter where you are on this planet earth you're on planet earth Mm -hmm. Being the most commercialized, um, um, high rise, having, you know, like shopping mall centered place, but you're still on Mama Earth. No matter how much concrete is there, no matter how much steel is around you, you're still on Mama Earth. And the energy that you're engaging with, no matter who you are, where you are, how you are, is that. Mm -hmm. Nothing that man can make to take that away. There's nothing. It's not possible because it's all here. Mm -hmm. 
Once we go someplace else, then we go to Mars. Mars has energy. Mm-hmm. And we're engaging with Mars energy, you know? So it's like understanding our place um, mm-hmm. as, as beings of this planet and understanding the responsibility that comes with that. And the last thing I would say is just, I think it can be challenging to maintain that focus and that um, level of engagement <clears throat> with so much global awareness. Mm. You know, thinking about everything that happens globally in terms of this issue um, of, of the environment and, and the planet. And I think, I mean, you like firsthand have experienced it in extreme ways locally. Mm-hmm. Like, very direct you know, mm-hmm. fires, the flooding, to like trees coming down, like it's no joke. And how the intention or the attention is probably much more, it's much easier to like streamline if it is put within maybe like a 10 or 15 mile radius. Mm-hmm. Or like, what do I need to do in this environment that I literally live in? Even though you work in the digital world, you literally live in this environment. Mm-hmm to make sure that while I'm alive and when I'm gone, my kids have everything, that selfish desire, Mm -hmm. right? And maybe if I have the bandwidth after that, you know, it can expand and extend and like we can share and inspire and co-create and all this stuff. But like, what can I really focus in on, you know, like hone in on full force to magnify this violence of the desire to protect what is? Um, or what has been from becoming something that may not be um, sustainable or, or uh, promoting of life. Mm-hmm. Mm. Think globally, act locally. Think globally, act locally. I love that. <laughs> I love that. It's so true. Think globally, act locally, and create that community around that that local thinking. Like have your communities. Mm-hmm. Have your your places where you can you can lean on, um, whether it's where you get your food um, or clean water, even or just like being aware of these things that we haven't needed to be aware of uh, if you've been living in modern society. Mm-hmm. Everything's been done for you. Everything's been done for us, and we see the harm that's doing. When everything's done for you, you become a nation with the highest rate of cancer mm-hmm. and heart and obesity and suicide and depression when everything is done for you Mm -hmm. it's a it's a farce Mm -hmm. it's not not real nothing is ever done for you not truly you can only do for yourself you know you can accept these things and these systems that have helped make life easier but at the end of the day there's nothing that can disconnect you from doing what you need to do to fill you and a lot of times that doesn't look anything like what the society or the system that is helping wants you to think of it it's not the acquisition of anything of anything other than maybe land to grow some some food <laughs> um it's not the accomplishments of anything other than like beautiful relationships and being able to enjoy your life. You know, it's 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 not taking anything other than moments to just be present and 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 really drink in what is. It's not the other shit. The other shit literally doesn't exist and it has a very like limited shelf life. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the ROI, I was I had this thought the other day, return on investment, we've been so played thinking return on investment is like about money. Mm. Right. For me, I think return on my investment is like, how much fucking fun did I have? Mm -hmm. How did I feel? How present was I? How much did I enjoy? That's my ROI. How much did I enjoy each moment that gets strung together to be my life? Mm -hmm. I could go out and accomplish all the things I think I want to accomplish on that little checklist. But then if I get to the end of it and all I'm thinking about is more boxes to check, because I'm this hungry ghost. Read yourself. Mm, sorry. I'm coming back to do it again. <laughs> 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 it's 
sorry. <laughs> Why did you say? Uh, hmm. Well said, brother. I love you. I appreciate you. I see you. Likewise. It's good to be seen. <laughs> good to be seen because I don't know what I look like. Hmm. <laughs> That uh, I know we got to end here, so I'll, I'll share one little nugget that just tied into that. That um, that practice of the pointing, it reminds me a lot of. Um. Oh wow, am I gonna blank on it right now? Hmm. Wasn't meant to be shared. It'll come up next time. All right. Yeah, it's not coming. All good. All right. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you next time. Love you, brother. Love you, man. Peace.